a microphone in position. Yes, boys and girls. Um, it seems I've forgotten to uh, add any details of what I'm doing now. So let me try and do that. I'll write it in a big comment or can I edit it here? Edit post. Excellent. Um, the title, I need to put that in. Dangerously unprepared. Um, let's just get that there, save. Lovely jubbly. Um, welcome um, to my second, no, third reading, but the second one on the tarot. Um, disguised as an advertisement for various kinds of tea and methods of preserving tea bags today. Um, I went to the Ukrainian shop and got an unusual variety of tea. I don't really know the, the name of because I don't read or speak Ukrainian. Uh, but I do recognize two words from the tea bag, which is Nozdravye, or what is that? Nazdrovye, Nazdrovye, uh, which of course means um, to health, or is it for health? To health. Anyway, uh, Nazdrovye to you as I pour, this is going to be difficult, uh, my very maternal uh, cup, which I got from Feira de Ladra the famous thieves market here in Lisbon and we begin our exploration of number 18 of the major arcana the moon um, why have I chosen this card well nothing particularly mystical I accidentally got it wet today when I was in the shower uh, I left the window slightly open to enjoy the morning light and I, to my horror, realised that on the Piatnik deck I had accidentally sprayed it full of my body juice slash shower water. So poor La Lune um, sprayed, really, sort of freckled with uh, my dejector and hot water. Um, of course, we're focusing not on the old, 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 old Marseille deck, or at least this version of it, focusing on the updated um, and Alejandro Hodorowski deck. Again, I've forgotten to add the Google image of this, uh, which in fact I'm going to do right now. It's very important to keep this up, to have a have this in mind and to let it interpret itself for you, so to speak. Uh, Moon Marseille. Yeah, very unprepared today. Um, maybe I am one connected to such thing, a starstruck or lunatic uh, person, someone who's sensitive to the waves of cosmic inspiration. Well, that's the whole idea of a, of a lunatic, someone who's very sensitive to the waves of the moon, lune, la lune, a lua in Portuguese. Um, so let me just add that to the post again, the Google image of this deck. Very important to have this up and have this um, in your sight if you are. I know I'm handsome, uh, but but really the the this is this is something more important than my gorgeous chiselled chin and peculiarly long but uh, rather exquisite nose. Um, so I'm going to read from the Way of the Tarot, Alejandro Hodorowski's masterpiece. From here which uh, may be a great book, but is actually rather heavy to hold. Um, so the things I do for you, you two people out there listening. Um, I think that's it. I think we should just crack on. Number 18, La Lune, The Moon. Subtitle is Receptive Female Power. The moon is one of humanity's oldest symbols. It represents the maternal feminine archetype par excellence, the cosmic mother. Its essential quality is receptivity. The satellite body of the moon reflects the light of the sun. In Arcanum 18, we find ourselves in the middle of the night, but it is a night illuminated by this humble receptivity. The moon is also a world of dreams, the imaginal realm and the subconscious traditionally associated with night. The tarot depicts the moon like the sun with a face, but it is not directly looking at us. It is a crescent moon seen in profile. 
This is um, a, a difference between the Piatnik and the Marseille deck. As you can see, there are variations on the moon. Now, the moon in the... Oh, this is difficult. Yeah, there we go. The moon in the Piatnik deck is rather... Uh, looks a bit nonplussed or perplexed um, and has a moustache, it seems, which is quite peculiar. I mean, that, that might just... I mean, the moon is re represents ma ma maternal powers, the feminine force, and so on. So it's quite a peculiar uh, woodcut. Um, but, of course, it's, it's busy. Lots going on, just like the Marseille deck. So um, the moon in the Marseille deck appears to be... God, this is difficult. It appears to be more... Um, well, it's side-on, of course. And it appears to be unmoving, and everything around, around it is spiralling or moving or attracted towards it but look how fixated the moon appears here the figure of the intellect and the subconscious while still forming part of it it remains invisible in this regard the moon symbolizes the mysteries of the soul the secret process of gestation everything that is hidden its face is not that of a young woman but is stamped by an ancient wisdom that emanates from its orange eyes. Orange eight, orange rays, sorry. The red rays in the background alternating with them indicate great vital capacity and extreme fertility, one that is contained and occult. In the foreground, the blue sky is dominant, a symbol of spirituality and intuition. The moon is connected with biorhythms, water, tides, menstrual cycles, and the transition from life, life uh, to death. I'm very curious about the figure of um, the pool, the um, well, a rectangle of water uh, that appears to us to be in perspective, going away from us into the vanishing point. Uh, pools appear a lot in my dreams. They seem to be a sense of quiet um, reclusion, how do you say it? A quiet escape, uh, uh, refuge, uh, but also a sense of danger of the alien, of the potentially the unknown, or at least the known that is very deepened in the esoteric depths of the body. Valentin Tomberg is a Christian, or was a Christian theologian, uh, a monk, I believe, who's really curious about uh, hermeticism and Kabbalah so he was all very voracious he had a huge appetite and ate loads of books uh, and he wrote meditations on the on the tarot uh, which he addressed to as a friend the reader being the friend and it's a fantastic book when trying to uh, when approaching the tarot from different angles um, the meditations on the tarot yeah, it's supposed to be anonymous. It's available online. It's got a bad P PDF version of it with some typos. but And it is a difficult book. It's very obscure. Uh, but the chapter on the moon is, is delightful and emphasizes the moon as the, um, an element of science. Uh, and what is science for Valentin Tomberg? It is a, a process of decomposition. Um, you find the composition of the world and you divide it. You uh, find molecules, atoms, uh, quarks, um, splitting everything into separation in order to analyze it. And the same is true for when these cards originated in uh, 15th, 16th century Marseille, but really previously in uh, 15th century Milan. Uh, the tarot deck was almost certainly commissioned uh, a version of the tarot deck was uh, uh, very likely to be commissioned by Maria, uh, Filippo Maria Visconti, the Duke of Milan, for a few decades in the early 1400s. And although the uh, major arcana of this deck are rather different, they had a very strong allegiance uh, in using this tarot deck for a kind of science of the body, a science of mystical knowledge. And there wasn't really that division in the Renaissance between um esotericism or, or should say maybe astrology and science itself so you know alchemy was a science back in the day before we developed mic microscopes for example just putting it very simplistically 
I've not even finished the first page. Um, the red rays in the background alternating with them indicate great vital capacity and extreme fertility, one that is contained and occult. In the foreground, the blue sky is dominant, a symbol of spirituality and intuition. So uh, biorhythms as well, connecting the movement uh, towards the moon. Uh, we haven't got on to the animals yet, but very basically, if you look at this sort of with blurred eyes or you just quickly have a sort of little impression, it seems that everything is revolving towards the sun or moving towards the sun. The sun is remaining, remains, excuse me, the moon. Everything moves towards the moon. Um, <clears throat> there's a cosmic attraction to the moon. And Tom Berg quite wonderfully um, relates the rays of the sun as all upside down as falling upwards. Now those two words, falling upwards, are fan fantastic uh, for giving an image of some kind of inverted transcendence. I read it once in a text by Heidegger, but I don't know where this phrase comes from and I've never been able to find the ri original. Uh, there's a, <clears throat> a more recent book by a Catholic, I think a Catholic or a Lutheran monk called Falling Upwards. And it, it's a nice image for the subreal as well. Subreal is something we've talked about in previous readings. As I'm sure you're aware. Keywords, night, intuition, feminine, cosmic mother. Interesting that he always keeps these in capital, Alejandro Hodorowsky, cosmic mother. A big part of the, the tarot that he values is the receptivity that is celebrated in the tarot, the way a man can become a woman, uh, spiritually speaking, using the tarot. Dream, receptivity, uh, to reflect, Mystery, attraction, imagination, magnetic, gestation, madness, poetry, uncertainty, phases. Madness being a good one here. Um, of course, we have the uh, word lunatic uh, from the Latin uh, lune. Just looking at my other laptop here. Um, just give me a second. Uh, but this, this is, uh, seems to be cross-cultural that the moon is associated with mental health, um, mental health problems, uh, with delusion, possibly being burnt by the, the, the sun's rays, as it were, by inspiration. Of course, the moon is only within our vision because of the sun's uh, radiation. Uh, lunaticus in Latin meant moonstruck. This is a great image, moonstruck. And uh, there's a Greek word which I'm going to mispronounce. Selenia zomai. Woo! Selenia, selenia zomai. That's fun. Which means to be epileptic. Uh, selene in Greek means moon. Isn't that interesting? So, also launa in German, launa. Guter Launa, good mood, mood coming from the moon. Beneath the actual celestial body, two animals are facing each other in a landscape in which two towers can be seen. These animals are apparently dogs, but maybe wolves or perhaps a dog and a wolf. They are howling at the moon and feeding on it, on the coloured drops it is releasing. From the mid, or oh, from the 17th or 18th century, the phrase came about to howl at the moon to howl at the moon meaning to engage in something completely useless to demand something that wasn't possible so in a way the moon has in certain respects or at least movements toward the moon have very negative con uh, context or, or, or connotations as it should say in uh in european thought which is sad the moon is great um of course we only see uh, again, Dark Side of the Moon, Claire de Lune, these are huge inspirations for music as well. But of course, we only see one side of the moon. Um, and this represents also the idea of science as the, the technique of the occult, uh, pouring light on just one thing we know and uh, totally obscuring another thing as well. It also delights me. Uh, the word for science in German is Wissenschaft. Wissenschaft. Um, I, I should have done a bit of research about this, but Wissen is to know or knowledge and shaft i believe means uh like a structure or like the concreteness of something so gemeinschaft community uh wissenschaft is very sort of visual idea of science 
Um, so these animals are apparently dogs, but maybe wolves, or perhaps a dog and a wolf. They are howling at the moon and feeding on it on the coloured drops it is receiving, releasing. Sorry, on the coloured drops it is re releasing. We can see this as a symbol of siblings, two children demanding their food, material, emotional or intellectual, from their mother, two loving or enemy brothers. Is there a sense that these two are, are driving themselves mad with their company, with their fraternity? We do associate, he, he's as mad as a dog, dogs with rabies, and the lone wolf on their, on their own, of course. Um, the light blue animal represents a more spiritual being. Hodorowski's really curious about colour. Um, its green tongue is receptive, its tail is raised, and we should note that the crenellated roof of the tower behind it is it behind it is open, also receptive. So we see the side of the tower um, in this card. There's an awful lot going on, but there seems to be a connection with the tower, the dogs, and the moon, particularly the moon. The, the towers could represent the institutionalization of, of inspiration, of knowledge. Could represent, for me, it strongly resembles like a, a university and academy. Um, and it looks quite fearsome and militaresque, but that's because of my own uh, oppressed desires or uh, unworked out uh, attitudes towards uh, universities, of course. But there, it is interesting, you can see the side of the towers here relating a little bit to the, the wonderful tower card, which undoubtedly we'll address at some point. Good, I've lost my place. So we're talking about the light blue animal uh, on the left. Its green tongue is receptive, its tail raised, and the tower behind it is open. The flesh-coloured animal, which could represent matter, has its tail down and an active red tongue. It is in front of a sealed tower with no apparent door. At the foot of this tower, we see three white steps that bring to mind the initiatory steps of the tower, as in the tower card of the Major Arcana. But the tower remains closed nevertheless, even its battlement is covered by a row of complementary crenellations, like a cl clenched jaw. That wonderful thing of the crenellations as a, an animal's jaw. We can deduce from this that the dense concrete material body is turned towards action and has no inclination to receive unless it is to come through the mind, symbolised by the light blue animal. We should nonetheless note that each of the dogs has one ear of the complementary colour, just as in the symbol of the Tao that each pole carries the seed of its opposite pole, of course the yin and the yang there. So the dogs sort of embody the opposites. The feet of the two animals create what resembles a three-level coat of arms out of the portion of the landscape in the space separating them. The deep green top level, the image of the one on on which the moon is shining corresponds to the receptive mind plunged in deep meditation. The middle level corresponds to the one on which the dogs are standing. Two plants are growing there, representing a rich emotional life. The lowest part, which is closest to the water, corresponds to the profound gestation of the sexual and corporeal dimension. We see three red drops in it, referring to animal nature. And back to the pool the expanse of water. The, in my view, the portal to the moon is, the, is water. The expanse of water in the lowest part of the card is squared out like a swimming pool, but agitated by wavy lines that bring to mind waves and tides. It could also be a port. Its first bank at the very bottom of the card is made up of rocks and wild natural vegetation, but we can see that the other end is bordered by straight lines, three black lines demarcating two blue lines, as if to indicate that the subconscious is constricted at, at its edge by rational dualism. In the centre of these womb-like waters, there is a crab or a crayfish that can be viewed as a symbol of the ego aspiring to contact with the moon. The contact already exists. Oh, this contact already exists. The crustacean and the celestial body share the same colours. The crustacean desires union with the moon without knowing, like all elements of this card, that it is already in communication with it. Cancer, the astrological sign, June and July. Um, I feel strongly crustaceans, lobsters, wood lice, um, crayfish, prawns, uh, barnacles, 
they are one of the more alien kinds of uh, fauna that we have. Uh, they seem to be rather organic, but stone-like. Or organic in the sense that our nails and our teeth are organic, but they are also minerals, stones in a sense. Um, the crustaceans, for what it's worth, are classified as, as being uh, as having exoskeletons and having um, pincers. So this, there appears to be kind of precision uh, to crustaceans, uh, to astrological science. Of course, along with the Scorpio, we have Cancer uh, appear in, in this sequence of the Zodiac. And um, the second text, apart from Hodorowsky or the second secondary text, uh, um, is a, a wonderful book which was available for free and I've put in the description by a woman called Helen Farley and it's called A Cultural History of the Tarot. And she makes great efforts to emphasize that the origins of this version of the tarot, the origins of the Marseille tarot, lie in Renaissance Italy and Filippo Maria Visconti, the Duke of Visconti, the Duke of Milan, I should say, who most likely commissioned, uh, of course, the tarot. And um, in, in the similar period of time, um, she goes on to say that uh, the Duke of the Medici, not so good with the history here, but the, the, the Duke um, insisted on having astrological readers or astro astrologers in his court, um, Filippo Maria Visconti, uh, I believe wouldn't leave the house with, without having his zodiac or his star signs read, whatever. I'm not great on astrology and I'm, I'm definitely walking towards um, this body of knowledge, but it's it's pretty essential uh, to get into grips with uh, aspects of the tarot. So whether we care about astrology or not doesn't really matter. Um, it mattered for the people who were curious about this this uh, kind of tarot, uh, or curious about Christian uh, hermeticism. Um, so there's a kind of gravitational force in reading the tarot that sort of is beyond your taste or whether you like it or not. It, it sort of, it pervades everything. Okay. We can view the crustacean either as immersed in the deepest depths of the water or to the contrary, swimming on top of it. In both cases, it encourages us to establish connect, contact with intuition, this buried treasure we all carry. We can also see that it is carrying two balls like, offering, like offerings in its pincers. The ego has something to offer in the spiritual work. And we should never forget that all of this, this work we're doing could be considered, yes, maybe pseudoscience, but a sort of sci science, sort of Wissenschaft, because of the word uh, experiment and empirical. Uh, this is an empirical knowledge. This is not a knowledge of text, as much as it looks like I'm re re referring to other texts and using my head. It's really not that, and I do this with a lot of joy, a lot of sort of bodily attraction. Uh, empirical uh, sort of an empirical approach to spirituality would be one where you are doing it for yourself and you have to discover for yourself and it's not through reading texts. Although uh, Valentin Tomberg talks about um, Henri Bergson discussing the need to use intellect to lose intellect. You need to learn a little bit to lose a bit, to, to grandly simplify it, uh, his words. Um, it's an interesting idea that you have to construct in order to deconstruct, if that makes sense. Uh, Karen Armstrong, the theologian as well, uh, is a comparative theologian, works with loads of different religions, who views approaching religion, her approach to religion, as one of study. She studies, she looks at history, and that's her form of spirituality. Uh, she says, well, why does it have to be easy? Why, why do we assume that it all has to come easy to us? Therefore, 
depending on how we look at this card, it will either represent deep intuitive communication or solitude and separation. We could imagine that the crustacean has come out to steal the blue balls he is holding in his pincers, that the dogs are fighting him, that everything feels cut off from the moon and its spiritual force. The drops could represent its representative capacity, but could also, in a negative sense, represent an insatiable absorption of energy. The card then refers to madness and mental chaos. These kind of deluded symbols that we see in um, David Peake's Twin Peaks. David Peake's. David Peake's Twin Lynch. Oh dear. But you know what I mean. These symbols, these symbols that keep appearing in Twin Peaks without explanation that seem to be beyond literal interpretation. They seem to have a kind of um, mad affixation to 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 the, the TV series. The, the Percolator, where Philip Jeffries is, appears to be trapped. Coffee itself as a symbol. Um, keys, uh, chains, necklaces, uh, they just keep coming up as if they have knowledge in themselves. The animist idea that objects know things and your knowledge is stored in them. And I, I, I really feel this with the two pebbles the, or the mysterious jewellery that the, <laughs> the crab appears to be, in a way, quite sweetly offering, holding back perhaps. We don't know if the source of this is danger we should really take this if it's our hours to take the danger of uh, approaching knowledge that's not yours. David Lynch or David Peaks, as I accidentally called him, was fascinated with the Manhattan Project, the um, 1940s uh, project to develop the to, to develop the atom bomb. Of course, successful, which is the crux of this third season of Twin Peaks. And he's, he's curious about his own form of uh, bodily science as well. He's, he, David Lynch, David Peaks, is completely mad about transcendental, transcendental meditation, which has as its core a very strong purported scientific basis in the unified field uh, of quantum physics. I'm not sure about whether it makes sense to blend those scientific and metaphysical or, or mystical languages but it's curious some people will really get um cottoned on or really get sort of uh, snagged on to certain ideas um like science to get into religion or spirituality okay if we count the lines that surround the inscription la lune so this is lines at the bottom and Hodorowski loves counting, he loves counting things. We will find, so if we count those lines, we will find 10 on the left and 12 on the right. 10 refers to the Wheel of Fortune as in Arcanum 10. There are also three animals, but whereas those of the Wheel of Fortune have not yet found the strength to get moving, we could say that the crab and the dogs are moved here by the magnetic force of the moon. 12 refers to Arcanum 12, the hanged man. He is closely tied to the moon as he represents a pause, a spiritual gestation, a receptive state. But in the moon, the receptive state is universal. The red and blue drops on the ground are in the midst of emerging to climb to the planetary body. The circulation is the mark of an energetic exchange between the Earth and the moon. Unusually for Hodorowski, he doesn't talk about 18 or well, not explicitly, 18, the number of this card, of course, is 10 uh, plus 8. 8 is uh, perfection. 6 is very related, beauty. But 8 is perfection, yet Hodorowski completely forgets men to mention this, and in fact he limits this reading to simply 5 pages. He, he devotes 7 uh, to the nameless arcanum of uh, number 13 of the first video. The second madness to this is the madness of too much knowledge. The idea of a very, very common um, occurrence of someone, the man who knows too much, the man who knew too much. Um, the, the Faustian pact one makes with the devil, which will eventually 
drive you mad or make you go blind staring at the sun too much um um I'm trying to think of a, a different i'm forgetting the other example but uh, you get what i mean too much of a good thing okay so now we go on to uh the section which is very short in this in this chapter uh called in a reading so if it comes up in a reading this card will generally refer to the world of the mother to all the aspects of the subconscious intuition and the personal mystery of being we can then direct the reading towards the relationship of the person consulting the reader with his or her mother my mum is called diane so diane is the goddess of hunt and uh, the goddess the moon goddess i'm curious that the hunt and the moon are very much related the idea of journey uh, but also the idea of something far away from you something uh, distance for a woman this card can be the omen of a profound realization for a man it is a prompt it is a prompt to cultivate traditionally feminine qualities like sensitivity intuition and so forth um it is one thing you've got to get to grips with uh, with marseille deck is this rather traditional ideas of uh, gender um and this isn't me being overly sensitive or trying to enforce a modern view onto a medieval approach it's quite the opposite i think uh, many traditions in spirituality try to seek unity between the male and the female the yin and the yang of course you've got the yin and the yang yin and the yang in a sense in the pincers of the crab but it seems to be inseparable from so many traditions the traditional ideas of authority and leadership in the male and receptivity uh, perhaps knowledge um, gestation um, warmth in in the female um, and i think it's it might be a bit uncomfortable uncomfortable to approach such traditional ideas of gender and say the moon is the woman but um well i feel it's really difficult to operate outside these binaries in, in many ways in in fact we want to transcend the binary of course we want to achieve a sense of wholeness that is intertwined just like the yin and yang with each bearing their each other's weight but to do that would be to take these binaries seriously in order to transcend them the moon is a good omen for anyone wishing to devote himself to poetry to tarot reading to all disciplines based on receptivity equally resonant in the moon are fear of the dark nightmares and all sorts of worries linked to the unknown sometimes without constraints it can symbolize poorly defined anxieties but also a voyage across the sea or arrival at a port it tends towards reverie and to all the states of soul generally associated with a lunar or lunatic nature its infinite receptive potential is its greatest treasure we see this constantly in the way of the tarot the celebration the championing of female receptivity whether that's based on a misreading a cultural learned const construct of femininity is well kind of undebatable it's quite clear that is one idea of what it means to be a woman on the other hand a woman receives and contains that is quite difficult to argue against men can't in the same strict sense oh, we can't bear the creation of another world thinking of the famous painting the origin of the universe i forget the name of the painter but late 19th century the origin of the universe is a vagina um, and I strongly believe that men can <laughs> develop their own sensitivities to a symbolic vagina the idea of creation within the belly is open to men and and women of course okay In its infinite receptive potential is its greatest treasure so we're going to finish the start well begin with the last section which is called and if the moon spoke 
and sort of a third way through, he lists his traditional interpretations. Uh, halfway through the speaking of the moon, I've not worked out quite why Hodorowsky interrupts the speaking moon. Uh, maybe it'll become, become clear later on. The moon speaks. You asked me to explain myself, but I am far from words, logic, discursive thought, intellect. I am a secret and inexpressible state. I am the beginning where all deep knowledge begins. When you immerse yourself in my silent waters without asking a thing, without trying to define anything, when you stand outside all light. The more you enter me, the greater your attraction to me. There is nothing clear in me. I am bottomless bottomless and all nuance. I extend into the realm of shadow. I am a swamp of immeasurable wealth. I contain all totems, prehistoric gods, the treasures of times past and times yet to come. Beyond the subconscious, I am creation itself. I steal away from all definition. I would love the moon to be this symbol of ineffable knowledge of knowledge that is never ours, knowledge that knows itself, something that's beyond us. Um, so the moon always extends away from our reach, but it's something we can still contact in this ineffable way. There is nothing clear in me. I am bottomless in all nuance. I extend into the realm of shadow. So perhaps a part of mystical knowledge is this um, wordlessness, not to say lack of contact, and contact is a word I really enjoy. I think it's really useful. Contact, contact. Not transcendence, not God, not light, but contact. It doesn't really need to refer to anything. It's like those words that don't need um, an object. I think it's intransitive, I think they're called. So here we go with the Hmong traditional interpretations. Intuition, night, dream, daydream, superstition, poetry, divination. Imagination, the deep subconscious, sensuality. Hidden truth, and in brackets, to be discovered. Hidden truth. The dark side of the moon. Madness, solitude. Night, terror. Gestation, unlimited request. This is a really peculiar one. Energy, vampire. Like the moon sucking, yeah, radiance from humans. Maybe that's the suspicion of a, a lunatic. Child seeking maternal love. Intensely close love, depression, secret, sea crossing, ocean, receptivity, obscure life of matter, ideal one seeks to achieve. I have to say this again, ideal that one seeks to achieve. Femininity, cosmic maternal archetype. I think the big unifier is there is no moon without the sun. Uh, in order for the moon to exist, it needs the sun's rays. We need to be positioned in a way that it's avail available to us. Uh, so to develop this divine knowledge, you have to know how to receive or how to be penetrated. Uh, so the moon speaks. Let's continue. I know that people have worshipped me. Ever since human beings developed a spark of consciousness, they have identified it with me. Like a perfect silver heart, I shine in dark shrouded night. I was the light they dimly suspected reigned in the depths of their blind souls. There where greedy entities lie and wait for the smallest spark of, the con of consciousness. Dimensions of madness, absolute solitude, frozen delirium. That painful silence called poetry. I recognise that in order to be, I had to go where I was not. I fell into myself, and each time I fell more deeply, falling upwards. Movement. Valentin Tomberg in Meditations on the Tarot says science is all to do with movement, moving onwards. Citing Solomon, there is nothing new under the sun. Citing the arrow, the, the um, parable, I guess, or the, the myth of the arrow that's just a series of stoppages, not moving. Where, where have I got to? 
So I fall into myself, and each time I fell more deeply. I lost myself while descending to nowhere, until at the end, me, in inverted commas, me, the obscure, was no more. Better yet, I was an infinite concavity. concavity. I was an infinite concavity, an open mouth containing all the thirst of the world, a boundless vagina that has become total, total aspiration. Then, in that vacuity, that absence of contours, I was finally able to reflect all the lights. An ardent light that I transformed into its cold reflection. Not the light that engenders, but the one that illuminates. Not the light that engenders, but the one that illuminates. How many of us have experienced a moonlit walk? I do not inseminate, I only indicate. Who receives my light knows what is nothing more. Um, I'll say that again. Who receives my light knows what is, nothing more. This is already more than enough to alter myself into total reception I had to refuse to give. All the rigid shapes of, of the night are annihilated by my light, starting with reason. Beneath my clear light, the angel is an angel. The wild beast is a wild beast. The madman is a madman, and the saint is a saint. I am the universal mirror. Everyone can see himself in me. The tarot, according to Alejandro Jodorowsky, is one big mirror. The tarot uh, isn't read by the reader. It is up to the reader to help the client, so client, to, for want of a better word, to help the desiring person to read for themselves. So the tarot is a mirror or the tarot reader is the mirror and the reading is done by the client. I don't like that word client, but you know what I mean. That's us done for today. Uh, I think I might do this thing of 10 a.m. Boring, scientific philosophy. 4 p.m. Party time. Uh, mystical stuff. Spiritual stuff. Drenching both sides will, of course, be di different varieties of tea. And I regret to have forgotten to show you the package of my obscure Ukrainian tea. Um... I have no idea what it is, but delightful is that you don't need to unnecessarily open the box to get your bag in the morning. You can just slip it out there. Admittedly, it's a bit of a struggle, but you could save milliseconds. That's what we're all about, to devote ourselves to things such as Habermas. Jürgen Habermas tomorrow, 10 a.m. We're going to finish off that chapter. Uh, hope via modernity, a loosening and an escape from mindless stasis. The postmodernists are moving away from them. We're going back to the modernists uh, via the, um, the legendary Jürgen Habermas. It won't be a long reading, don't worry. Not like today, two and a half hours. And uh, maybe tomorrow we'll skip a bit of tarot and read a bit of um, uh, Modern Nature by Derek Jarman. Uh, and I'm open to requests. Um, go and buy me some books and send them to me because uh, there's no work in Lisbon. All work is gone, thanks to the virus. So send me stuff. It could be online, but I like to, I like to touch, I like to feel the book. Um, keep your questions coming. Uh, but there's been one common madness over here. Don't know how to contain all this business. Yeah, 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 10 a.m., that's right. Uh, Got to get up, got to have ritual. It's important at these times what we have ritual, that we commune, that we meet together. Um, obviously, you you all are so shocked and in awe of the tarot that uh, comments are yet to come. That's absolutely fine. The period of silence, elevated silence, will, will contain the rest of this reading. So thank you, Nama. Yes, 10 a.m. I am a sick man and I uh, will give you a thumbs up awesome satisfying communication we have nowadays tomorrow uh, i'm a bit lo low on tea i'm not sure what i'm going to have but i'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll carry on the conversation we'll get through habermas and it'll all be fun from there i've also been thinking of reading uh where's he gone now well he's escaped simon reynolds a fantastic writer on rave culture as well as glam rock I, he's such a good writer i thought I'd, I'd read anything by him and it would be interesting simon reynolds wrote a fantastic document of post-punk history uh he wrote on retro mania his uh idea of where we are now with this kind of genre 
a blend, uh, this mi- I would use the word postmodern mix of many pop cultures within uh, one musical form. Retro Man is fantastic. Um, and uh, his book on his recent book on glam rock, how this relates to Bataille, the subreal inner alchemy, I'm sure I'll find a tenuous link. And I would also really enjoy reading, uh, and I'm, I'm, I know a lot of you have read about him, Lester Bangs, uh, the, the famous rock critic um, from the 70s and 80s New York, um, a man who was found dead, uh, choking on his, choked on his own vomit, having listening, listened to Human League's Dare, yet had championed so many varieties of music in his time, particularly, you know, rock rock music that that shook the body and brought a sense of meaning to a very difficult traumatic part in in america's past so lester bang bangs's essay of pop and pies and fun will come up at some point and uh, i'm gonna say goodbye thanks all for logging in and i will see you tomorrow at 10 or at 4 p.m